Hello, and welcome to another video in my Fundamentals of Orchestration series. In my last few videos, I introduced the woodwind section of the orchestra and discussed each individual instrument family in detail. In this video, I'd like to discuss orchestrating melodies or melodic material for woodwinds for either a solo woodwind or for a combination of woodwinds in unison or octaves. As always, I'll be using samples from orchestral tools to help in my demonstrations. Let's get started. This figure shows the ranges and different registers of each of the most common orchestral woodwinds. There are plenty of additional woodwinds, many of which I discussed thoroughly in my previous videos, that I won't discuss as much going forward. I'll mostly focus on the common orchestral woodwinds in the modern orchestra, so that includes the flute and its most common double, the piccolo, the oboe and its most common double, the English horn, the clarinet and the bass clarinet, as well as the bassoon and the contrabassoon. Here you can see I've divided each instrument into at least three registers based on things like timbral characteristics, dynamic ranges, and ease of playing. I've included a dynamic range for each division, and keep in mind that these ranges are a bit subjective and can even differ from player to player. These markings also don't mean that you, as the arranger or composer, can't indicate dynamics outside of the listed range for each register of each instrument. For instance, you can still write piano or pianissimo on music written for oboe at the bottom of its range, and the oboist will try his or her best to play softly. However, the end result on this instrument will simply not be as quiet as it might sound on a flute or clarinet at the same pitch. Most experienced orchestrators will intuitively be aware of these registers and timbral differences, and they won't even have to think about it before arranging music. The best orchestrators know these instruments inside and out, and can instinctively make orchestration decisions based on familiarity and experience. I'd like to spend some time now discussing how you might arrange melodies or melodic material for the woodwind section. Let's say that the task is to arrange this melody for a solo woodwind instrument. If you can choose from any of the woodwind instruments, how do you go about choosing which one? Well, often melodies will sound great on basically any of these instruments, but there are still a few things to consider. First, let's say that you have to keep the melody in the same transposition and range. In this case, the melody's range is from C4 to B flat 4. Just to clarify, I'm calling middle C, C4. That's the system I grew up learning. I know that many people learned middle C to be C3, and many DAWs have middle C as C3 but I'll stick with what's most familiar to me. So for this melody, if we have to keep it within the original octave, meaning we can't bump it up or down by an octave or transpose it to another key, then we are limited to the instruments within range. So any of these instruments would technically work, though they would each sound different. Oftentimes the composer will provide more information than just the notes that can help in our decision. In this case, the composer has indicated a dynamic level, a tempo marking, and expressive marking, as well as phrase markings. The main clues, to me at least, are the dynamic marking of piano and the expressive marking that means sweetly or endearingly. The flute might be a good choice here as the dynamics would work well and the timbre of the flute in this register would fit. Also, perhaps the English horn would work or even the clarinet. I probably wouldn't choose oboe here because in this register the oboe would be too aggressive. I also probably wouldn't choose bassoon because even though the dynamic would be fine, the bassoon has a very intense sound in its highest octave that I don't think would fit this melody. On the other hand, if the same melody was written with these markings, oboe might make more sense. I think English horn would still work, but flute probably not, clarinet probably not, and bassoon also no. Let's try another melody. Here we have a melody marked sorrowful with a range from E5 to C6, Keeping it in the same octave, I think flute and oboe are our best options. Piccolo would technically work, but would be too quiet and not fit the character. Clarinet, I think, would be too bright. And English horn doesn't have that high C, not to mention the timbre in the highest part of the English horn isn't particularly effective. Flute would sound nice and is in a good part of its range to project over top of a thinner orchestral texture. Oboe might even be better than flute, as it would be in a very expressive part of its range, and also wouldn't have a hard time projecting over a relatively thin texture. I also want to mention something important about octaves here. Our ears aren't always great at hearing specific octaves, 
but they're really good at hearing how notes sound high or low relative to an instrument's range. For instance, a low piccolo note sounds low, and a high bassoon note sounds high, even if those notes are actually the same exact frequency. So having said that, arrangers often move melodies up or down an octave to fit an instrument's range, especially to take advantage of a particular instrument's timbral characteristics at that range. For this melody, if I transpose the melody down the octave, the classical symbol for this is 8VB, then I notice that the bassoon might be the perfect choice now, so long as I don't need it to project over an entire orchestra. I'd like to explore this further, so I've written a few short melodies with piano accompaniment. The first example is based on a Romantic era style, and the melody sits in a medium register, let's call it a mezzo-soprano range. Notice the expressive text indicates the mood of the example is to be tender, and the dynamics are piano, although whatever instrument is playing, it must compete in a similar register as the right hand of the piano. The range of the melody is from B-flat 3 to B-4, which allows us to choose from these woodwind instruments if we're sticking to the exact octave. It looks as though oboe will just barely work, the English horn will work, as well as the clarinet, bass clarinet, and bassoon. We could also transpose the melody up the octave, which would better suit the oboe, and would allow us to use the flute as well. Let's hear how this melody sounds with just the piano first. Let's hear how this might sound with the oboe. I probably wouldn't choose this instrument in this octave because of the timbre of its low range. And that last note in particular doesn't sit as well in the oboe. If we bump the melody up an octave, we can take advantage of a sweeter, more gentle part of the oboe's range. If you must keep the melody in the original octave, but you also want the double reed timbre, English horn would work, and it sits in a very nice part of the instrument's range for the stylistic needs of this melody. Another option would be the clarinet. In the original octave, the clarinet is in a relatively weak part of its range, so the climactic notes in the phrase in measure 5 and 6 don't feel as climactic because of the timbre of that part of the clarinet. If you bump the melody up the octave, then you get into the upper clarion register, which is very bright. That might also be the wrong timbre for this particular melody, but I do think it works better than the octave below. Here's a version with bassoon in the original octave, and because the bassoon is relatively weak in volume in this range, 
you might run into issues with balancing against the piano. To my ears, the bassoon in this range doesn't quite capture the right aesthetic or mood, as it sounds a bit too strained and intense. For one last version of this melody, let's hear how flute up the octave might sound. It sounds nice in this range, but I'm not sure that I would pick flute over oboe up the octave, or English horn at the original octave. This is obviously more of a subjective decision, and the beauty of orchestration is once you make sure that things like ranges, and instrumental limitations, and balancing dynamics aren't issues, then it's just a subjective decision that you have to make. You might end up making hundreds of these types of decisions throughout an entire work, and each one is important even if the act of making that decision is completely intuitive. Let's look at another melodic example. This melody's range is from F sharp 4 to A5. I'll first play the example with piano on the melody. The first thing that caught my attention was the dynamic markings. It starts soft and then crescendos to forte in measure five. So I wanna find an instrument that allows for measure five and six to seem more expressive and prominent. And if I need to transpose the melody up or down by an octave, I'll look for those two measures to still be in the most expressive part of the instrument's range. Here's what this would sound like using a flute on the melody. The only problem to me here is that the flute easily gets covered up in measure 4, as that part of the flute's range is weaker. If we bump the melody up the octave, then we have a more piercing, brilliant timbre on the high A in measure 6. Let's try this melody with oboe. It sits in a good part of the range, and although the high A on the oboe isn't exactly the loudest part of the instrument, it shouldn't have difficulty projecting over the piano texture. One more version here, let's try clarinet. I chose clarinet in A instead of B flat, and if you haven't checked out my video on the clarinet family, you might want to give that a watch if you're confused about the differences between A and B flat clarinets. This melody sits nicely on the clarinet, and measures 5 and 6 will certainly be expressive and bright on the instrument. For my last piano and melody example, I chose to look at the first part of the melody to the folk song Poor Wayfaring Stranger. If you've been following along with my channel, you'll know that I recently wrote a large orchestral work based on this melody, and I've used the melody as examples for several of my videos. I've chosen to reharmonize the first part of that melody here. The melody has a range of C4 to C5, and notice how the piano chords are voiced relatively low and out of the way of the melody. Here's what this sounds like first with piano on the melody. <laughs> 
Because the piano accompaniment is in a lower range than the melody, and because the dynamics are marked piano, low flute might actually work for this melody. Oboe could work as well, and would certainly sound heavy in this range, although perhaps not quite as graceful as some of the other options. Instead of oboe, English horn might work well. I actually featured English horn on this very same melody in my orchestra piece. And lastly, here's what it would sound like on clarinet. I think I actually prefer the melody on clarinet here. Timbrally and aesthetically, I like how the clarinet fits this folk style, especially considering the harmonic and melodic note choices. In the second half of this video, I want to look at combining woodwinds on melodic material. Essentially, once you've familiarized yourself with the different woodwind instruments, and know how each instrument sounds at each part of its range, you can start combining instruments using the same knowledge. For instance, let's look at this melody. You might recall it from a previous video on the flute section that I made. It has a melodic range from A4 to D6. Here's how it sounds in solo flute. So on the flute, this melody sits in the middle to upper part of the instrument's range. Overall, I'd say the timbre of this melody on flute is bright, but not piercingly bright. Since orchestral woodwind sections often have multiple flutes, if we give this melody to two flutes, the resulting sound will further emphasize this characteristic. In this case, an even brighter, clearer sound with more presence and slightly more volume. You can sort of treat this like a simple formula, although you'll want to trust your ears first and foremost. You might try two flutes plus two oboes. The flutes will add clarity and a bright timbre, and the oboes will be thinner and more expressive in that range. The result will be bright, but also very lyrical and expressive. The overall volume will increase because four people are playing now, and while the flutes might slightly overpower the oboes, the overall timbre will still be a nice combination, and one that most of us are used to hearing. Let's hear how these sound. First, the two flutes version. Now let's listen to what it sounds like if we add piccolo an octave above. <laughs> 
The piccolo will be in a fairly bright part of its range, although not necessarily piercing. So by combining flutes and piccolo, we are emphasizing the bright timbre, but it shouldn't be too piercing. Let's add both oboes to that. Not only will we add more players and thus more clarity, presence, and volume, but we'll add a bit of that expressive, lyrical quality of the oboes in this range. What happens if we add clarinets to this? In the same octave, clarinets will be very bright, so by adding them, again we're emphasizing the bright timbral quality of the instruments. We can continue to add woodwind instruments, for instance English horn. The English horn wouldn't work at the original octave, so let's transpose it down the octave. The only potential problem I see now is that there could be balancing issues between octaves. I'll move one of the clarinets down the octave. You could move both down, or even one of the oboes. If I want to include bassoons in this texture, I'd probably want to bump them down an additional octave, so that's an octave below the English horn. We're now spanning four octaves in total. The bassoons sort of stick out as being lower in register, so this might not always work, but obviously it depends on the context or whatever else is happening in the orchestra at this moment. Moving on to another example, here we have a melody from the oboe introduction video that sounds like this. Looking at the dynamics, the tempo, the range, and any expressive words given, in this case tenderly, you should be able to come up with possible combinations of instruments. Here's what two oboes sound like. Obviously with two instruments, you lose some of the expressive qualities and tenderness from a solo instrument, but you gain a bit of clarity and volume and reinforce that part of the oboe's range, which is thin and expressive in this case. What happens if we combine solo oboe with solo flute? We maintain a bit of the soloistic timbre of each instrument, but gain some clarity and volume, and we add the gentle timbral qualities of the flute in that range to the thin, expressive oboe. Because the range of this melody extends into multiple parts of each instrument's range, the balance between flutes and oboes will change throughout the melody. In the first two measures, the solo oboe will naturally be stronger than the flute, but in the third measure, the flute will move into a much stronger part of its range and potentially overpower the oboe. These balancing issues are good to be aware of, but there's nothing really wrong with having weird balance issues. Woodwind players are used to playing together in all combinations of instruments and registers, and it's not worth worrying about balancing everything perfectly. Once again, trusting your ears is the most important thing here. With two flutes and two oboes, we get more clarity and volume, and also don't need to worry at all about balancing two solo instruments. Let's add a few more instruments now. The English horn and two clarinets all an octave lower, so that we maintain the overall tender sound. I think clarinets up the octave would be too bright. <laughs> 
Moving on, here is another melody from the oboe video, this time the Agile melody. Here's what that sounds like on solo oboe. Looking at this melodic material, everything in here, the range, the double tongue, the trills, and the overall agility would probably work on any of the woodwind instruments, although double tonguing would be more difficult on clarinets. It would be no problem at all for flutes, and this entire line would be extremely idiomatic for flutes. Here's what two flutes and two oboes sound like. If we want to incorporate the other woodwind instruments, but don't want to give all of them fast staccato notes or trills, we might try picking and choosing which notes to give to each instrument. Here I've added piccolo, English horn, clarinets, bass clarinet, and bassoons. But you can see not all of them have the full collection of notes and rhythms. I've chosen a few moments, like the opening eighth note, as well as the last two measures to emphasize and give to everyone involved, but the rest is split up. While both have the entire original line, I decided to have flutes on the trills and double tongue notes in measure two, and piccolos just on the trilled note. Of course, piccolos are capable of double tonguing or playing these fast staccatos. I think the piccolo would only add to the texture if up the octave, and I didn't really want that piercing timbral addition. To make the English horn and clarinet parts a bit easier, I've given them single staccato eighth notes in measure two, so the integrity of the 16th notes can be maintained in the flutes and oboes. Let's give this a listen. This is just one potential scoring of this line, and I'm sure you could come up with many equally effective combinations or arrangements. Here's another example, this time from the bassoon video I made a week ago. Let's hear how it sounds in just the bassoon. I could go through the list of potential combinations for this, but instead I want to just look at one, and it was actually my first instinct. Because the music is marked mysteriously, I thought it might be interesting to have two bassoons joined by piccolo, two octaves above. It would be in a good range for the piccolo, strong and bright enough but not piercing. I think two bassoons will balance decently well with one piccolo, but I don't even need to worry about that so much. The only problem here is that the melody extends downwards beyond the range of the piccolo, so I'll sneak in a flute in measure 5, and then when the piccolo is out of range, I'll add the other flute in. It won't be a seamless transition, but it should be effective and should blend nicely. Here's another bassoon example, this time in its low range. The descriptive text of dark and hauntingly means that we can add in all of the low woodwinds that rarely get used for melodies. So here are two bassoons, a bass clarinet, and a contrabassoon down the octave. I have one more example today. This melody is from the clarinet video, specifically one showing off the agility of the clarinet. <laughs> 
the leaps, dynamic changes, and articulations present a challenge to orchestrate, but this could be another example where you pick and choose what notes and rhythms to give to each instrument. So here's what I came up with. Again, you could do this a bunch of different ways, and this was just my first attempt. My strategy was to exaggerate each part of the original clarinet version. So what I mean by that, the first note was in the high register and accented at fortissimo, so I gave that to the upper winds, including piccolo up the octave. The next set of eighth notes jumped down in the clarinet to the bottom part of its range, so I gave that to just clarinets, bass clarinet, and bassoons. I stuck with this strategy throughout to reinforce each aspect of the line and take advantage of the full range of the woodwind section. Dynamic changes are achieved in multiple ways here, first by the dynamic marking on each part, second by the number of instruments playing, and third by the register that the instruments are in, taking into account differences in timbre and dynamics at each part of the range. It's a lot to keep track of, but to me it's sort of a puzzle that has many possible solutions, depending on what you want. And I really enjoy this kind of thing, especially when it involves thinking more creatively. Let's hear how this version sounds with all of these instruments. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, that's all for this one. Next up will be a video on arranging piano music for woodwinds, and after that I'll look at combining woodwinds and strings. If you've enjoyed these videos, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel. I've been enjoying the feedback, so please leave a comment or question below and I'll try to answer everybody. Thanks so much, and see you next time.